In this video, we are going to make huge improvements to my procedural stitch system, which allows to generate stitches on any kind of mesh with a simple vertex group selection, and most of all, it is fully stable with any animation pipeline from alambic caches, cloth simulation, deform modifiers, and much more. As usual, this is a simple brick in my full cloth making toolbox I am currently developing, and which is already available on my Gumroad. Originally, this system was made using math to compute the stitch shape because it was intended for a very precise use case, but for now, let's modify it completely so we can use some curves as kind of unit stitches and instance them over our mesh before draining them together and making the full stitches. So let's start with a simple test geometry. I'm adding a simple cylinder, making it smaller so it's around 10 cm wide adding a bunch of loop cuts and doing some simple proportional editing to have a more interesting shape. Then let's just select one edge loop and add it to a new vertex group called Stitches. Now in the Geometry Nodes tab, let's add a new setup. And here the first step will be to separate the geometry to only take our selection. So add a separate geometry node. And for the selection, let's add a compare node set to float and equal and we are going to check if it is equal to 1 and I'm going to put the A input into a new group input for the geometry nodes. Here in the modifier tab I can set it to attribute and select my stitches versus group I created earlier. Now let's rename the input selection and with this selection we can convert it to a curve with a mesh to curve node so we already have a pretty nice curve to work with. Now the only issue is that to instance our threads we need the information of the normal of the curve and right now it should be all over the place so before separating the geometry while we still have the full geometry let's add a capture attribute node set to vector and let's put aside the normal of the mesh so we still have this information. Now after the mesh to curve node let's add a set curve normal node and we can set it to free so we can plug in a custom normal value which is going to be or a captured normal from before. And right after that, let's add a resample curve node so we'll be able to create a set number of points on which to instance the threads. And here I'm just going to set it to length and put the length as a new group input, which I'm going to call stitch step size. And here, because my cylinder is approximately 10 cm wide, I'm going to put a step size of about 5 mm. And let's set this new input as a single value. Now after that, we'll be able to instance our stitches. So let's add an instance on points node. And just to test it for now, for the instance, let's add a cone, which I'm going to make really small. Now for the rotation, we'll need to align it to the tangent and normal of the curve. So for this, we need some align Euler to vector nodes. And for the first vector, I will get the normal value, which I want to align to the D component and then let's do another node with this as the rotation input and here I want to align the Y input with the curve tangent like so and now I can set this rotation as the input of this instance on points node perfect and let's replace those cones with the stitches so here in my file I already have some base curve stitches so here I have a simple pattern for a chain stitch I also have a saddler stitch, a kind of hand stitch, lock stitch, and a more complicated kind of stitch with three different threads. And following this example, we'll be able to make any kind of stitch we want, as long as the stitch is oriented along the y-axis, and with the up direction being the z-axis, and also if we take a look at the handles, all the curves direction should go toward the positive y-axis. So here it is the case for the three threads on this stitch. And now let's go back to the Geometry Nodes tab and I will just drag in my stitch types collection. So first let's allow to select one stitch or a custom curve. So here we can do that with a separate geometry node and make sure to check separate children and reset children and let's set the type of the separate geometry node to instance. Now for the selection we'll just need to check if the index of the instance is equal to some value and for the value to make it easier to use, I will use a menu switch node so we could be able to set the name of the different stitches instead of just setting up indexes. So here I will just quickly copy and paste all the stitch names and put it as input of this menu. Now let's set it to integer 
and set the integer value to 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then we can put this into the equal input. And let's put the menu as a new group input. So now we'll be able to switch between the different stitch types. Now let's also allow to have a custom stitch curve with an object info node. Set the object as a new input, which I will rename, which I will rename custom stitch. And let's also rename the menu input to stitch type. And let's set the object info node to as instance. Now to switch between the custom curve and the selected curve from our collection, we'll be able to check the domain size in mode instances. And with a switch node, we'll be able to switch between the custom curve if the instance count is different than zero. And if not, we we'll use the custom curve. So let's try this out. And it seems to be working really well. Now, after this, let's realize the instances and resample the curves. Let's set the count to zero for now and add this as a new group input and also plug it in as the selection so that if the count is set to zero, we have no resampling. And if it is different than zero, we have some resampling. And this will be unit stitch resampling, which I will set to a single value. Now let's reset the position of the curves so that it doesn't matter if we set our unit stitch in a place that is different from the origin. And to do this, we can just compute the bounding box, average the two values by adding them up and scaling it by minus 0.5. And then if we use th this as the translation input of a transform geometry node, it will always set the position of our curve around the origin. Now we can also do about the same thing to properly resize the stitch to any dimension we want. So with the bounding box, this time let's instead take the max value and subtract the mean value. And if we add a vector math node set to divide with this subtracted value as the second input, we'll be able to resize the stitches very easily. And for the resizing to work properly, make sure to set it as a second transform geometry in the scale input like this. So now whatever vector I put in right here, it will set as the curve's dimensions. And it will also always stay around the origin. And now the final step for this custom group will be to remove the starting point of the curve so that when we join all the curves together end to end, we will not have duplicated points. So let's add a delete geometry node set to point and all, and for the selection, let's add an endpoint selection node with a value of one on the start size only. And one other info we'll need beside the end geometry will be the number of threads in our selection. So let's add a domain size node set to curve, and here we'll need the spline count. Now all this we can add in a custom group with control G, and toward the end, let's also output the spline count rename the output geometry to unit stitch curve and the input will be stitch type for the menu, custom stitch for the object and for the count it will be unit stitch resampling which you can set to a single value and let's also add the vector with which we divide the value from the bonding box which is effectively the dimension of our stitch as a new input so for now I'll just set or the value to one. So the default value is set. So set this as a new input and the subtype will be translation. And we can also set it as a single value. Just a quick pause here. If you are finding this tutorial helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe to support me. That will be really helpful. Now back to the tutorial. And now with all this, we can plug our selected unit stitch curve as the instance input of our instance on points node from before. And let's set the dimensions vector. Let's add a combined XYZ node and with a new group input we can already set the stitch step size as the Y input and let's also add two new input parameters which are going to be stitch width and stitch thickness which I'm both going to set to single value of subtype distance with default value of maybe two millimeters thick and three millimeters wide now this is beginning to look really nice. We'll just need to combine all the curves together so they are joined into single threads. 
But before this, because the dimensions are computed with the bounding box, we will have issues with some threads. So for example, this one, where if we instance it one after the other, we will want the stitches to have some kind of overlap. So for this to work properly, we will need to add a multiply value with a math node on the y input of the combined XYZ node. So this will be a value to edit the stitch step size. So let's set it to multiply and put a default value of 1 as a new group input, which will be the step multiplier. So here we can set it to a subtype factor with a minimum value of 0 and maximum value of 2, which we will be able to use very easily later. So now let's join all the instances together. So first we'll need to realize the instances, and then we already have a really nice custom node group, which we made in a previous video to join all the curves together. And this is the splines to curve node. Now this is already looking way better for some stitches, where we only have one thread, but, uh, but the issue we have with uh, some other stitches is that with multiple threads, they are all put together in a single curve. And here the best way to work around this would be to use a repeat zone and actually iterate this instance on points node for the different curves we have in our unit stitch. So with a new repeat zone, and here we will not put our base curve or the unit stitches as the geometry input of the repeat zone. We'll just need to add a join geometry node in the inside like this. And here we'll just join the output of our spline to curve node. And let's output this group. The iteration count will be the spline count from our unit stitch selection. And here to feed a different curve at each iteration, we'll first need to count the iteration. So add a math node, and on the repeat zone we will need a new input, which we just count the iteration, which we can set to integer, and we will just add one to this value at each iteration. And with this we'll be able to separate the geometry of the unit stitch by setting it to spline, and just checking if the index is equal to the current iteration we just computed, like so. And now we can put this new selected geometry as the instance of our instance on points node. And now it should be working perfectly. Let's just set the step multiplier back to one. And here we already have some really nice stitches with three threads. Here my lock stitch is looking weird, but it's just because it is not intended to be as wide. Let's just clean this up. And with this, we'll be able to convert this to a beautiful thread with the node groups from the previous video. But first, let's combine this geometry back with our base geometry. And to be able to select it in the next group, let's also add a custom attribute by setting capture attribute on the output of our repeat zone, set it to spline and boolean value, and let's set it to true and output this as the group output. And here I just rename this stitch curve. And now I can add the group we made in the previous video, which is stitch curve to mesh. And by changing a few parameters, we can make it look really nice. And while we are at it, let's also store a few custom attributes. So you'll be able to shade the different threads with different colors. So for this, we can set a store named attribute node. So the first will be set to integer, and here I will just rename it cmtb for cloth making toolbox underscore thread underscore index, and this will just be the iteration count. Here we can also set a few other parameters, because for example here, here with different threads, if I animate the trim start value, the different threads don't appear at the same time, and this is because of the length of one of the and this is because the length of one of the thread is way longer than the other. And to fix this, I can set a custom attribute right after we resampled the curve. So here I can set a store named attribute, set to float and spline. The name will be cmtb underscore curve underscore length. And the value will be the length attribute from the spline length node. Now, because of the way the spline to curve node is made, we have no value of keeping this custom attribute from before and after this node. 
but we can work around this by using a simple index node because the indexes of our points are kept from before and after being joined together. So here we'll be able to sample a custom attribute named attribute, which is going to be our curve length, the index being the index node. And here we should be able to set this as a new attribute of the same name of type float. And let's just put this as the value. And now because of how we made this node in the previous video, all the curves are being trimmed at the same time. And with this base setup, you can also tweak the curves really easily to get all kinds of different results with a single setup. And here you may be wondering what this code on the side is. And this is just a simple script, which I can activate to toggle all the unused group input and tidy up my whole node setup. I uh, will make a video about this in the future, but right now it is already available on my GitHub, which I put in the description. And here we can fix the issue with the wiggling curves when we are trimming it by also fetching the normal value from before the splines to curve node. So Ctrl Shift D duplicate the sample index node, set it to vector, and for the value, let's take the normal. So right after we converted everything, two curves. We can also set curve normal by setting it to free and put this vector as the input, which should fix everything. As an afterthought, another fix we can do is to correct the issue where the longer thread is twisting slower than the shorter ones. And to fix this, we can actually compute the ratio of the length of each unit stitch to the stitch step size from the group input and using this ratio to increase or decrease the total curve length on which the twisting speed is based. So you can set this to multiply and plug it right here. So now the twisting speed on all the curves is more consistent. But this brings back the issue of the inconsistent trim speed between the different threads of our stitch. So to fix this, we need to duplicate this attribute, which is the curve length. And the previous value we now modified, I will just rename from curve length to thread length. And the curve length from before, I will just duplicate again the sample index node with Ctrl Shift D to sample back the original value, which was just our named attribute cmtb underscore curve underscore length. And now let's go to our stitch curve to mesh node group. And here in the block twist curves, I will need to select the other attribute we just created, which is the thread length. And this should fix everything. Let's just correct the typo really quick. And that's better. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this tutorial helpful. All the files are available on my Gumroad in the Cloth Sewing Toolbox Asset Pack. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you are into that. Thank you for watching and see you next time.